Irish people claim that the first teachers of their race came not from the East, from Europe, but from the West. And that ancient robed priests came out of the ocean on the west coast of Ireland. And that these were the ones who instructed them. The Irish have a considerable folklore dealing with Atlantis. There is also a great deal of lore relating to this uh, in the Spanish area and in Portugal. And of course what is left of North Africa bears uh, testimony to the same basic accounts. We have comparatively little knowledge of a primitive state of Europe. We have some. We can envision the Europe of the Goths and the Vandals. But far deeper than these records are the ancient cultural institutions of the Druids and of the various Bardic orders that were behind uh, the common ways of things. The Druids were a very learned people, as Caesar testifies. Where did they derive their learning? It has been common to assume that they had some connection with Asia. How? Where? When? None of these questions are adequately answered. We cannot pin down the original of these different forms of learning. This is especially true when we turn from history to Stonehenge or to the great Druidic or pre-Druidic monuments in Brittany in France. Here immense mazes, tremendous architectural structures covering huge areas and arranged with considerable mathematical skill must certainly precede the periods in which we believed mathematics to be available to man. We are therefore searching religiously, philosophically, scientifically, ethnologically, anthropologically for the beginning of the human race. Not its physical beginning, merely as creature, but the beginning of its ascent from savagery or a primitive state uh, to the levels or to the platforms which can come within investigation by available instruments. Where, then, can we turn? Probably the only way we can turn is this, that in which most have turned who have sought to penetrate the almost intentional wall of oblivion that has been built up by opinion, attitude, and prejudice between us and the origin of our own culture. We know that the Chaldeans, at a comparatively early period, uh, sailed along the coasts of Western Europe reaching as far as Britain and the Scandinavian countries to engage in the merchandising of tin. And we know that wherever these ancient expeditions came and visited, they left not only the immediate objects of barter, but a cultural impact upon the peoples that they visited. In other words, wherever the Chaldeans bartered, they left something of their philosophy and their culture, further testified to by the experiences of Caesar in interrogating the wise people of Gaul and Brittany. Thus the migration of a great mercantile project traveling into very far areas would certainly imply the establishment of trading centers, trading posts, outposts of one kind or another, and even permanent settlements. The trader is always the same. 
And along the routes of his journey, he leaves indelible impressions of his vices, his virtues, and his achievements. While we have only myths to work with, that is true, every one of these groups of myths tell essentially the same origin story, that the peoples came from elsewhere, that they came with leaders who had led them from some previous location, that these leaders were responsible for the establishment of higher orders of culture in primitive areas. Thus the natural or aboriginal peoples of these areas all insist that their cultures began with the advent of divine beings who came from remote places, from a long distance, from other lands. These remote beings did not resemble the people to whom they came. They wore different clothing. They spoke a different language. But in each case, they brought ideas and from these ideas, the cultures of these local groups derive their impulse and their inspiration. I think we are fully justified in beginning to contemplate this broad picture of a world that had attained to a considerable degree of advancement long ago, and that this advancement was what? <coughs> Stamped out, destroyed, but that the memory of it lingered on and will always continue to linger. And because of this memory has become an essential part of the spiritual, intellectual, moral, and even physical lives of practically everyone who has lived since that time. That from these have come the symbols and the great teachings and the great beliefs. Now in the light of the same thing, let us assume for a moment that we are seeking to discover the uh, axis or the central theme of the Atlantean culture. We have, of course, so little to go on, but we have something. And we have a number of points that are of interest to us. What was the great religious symbol among the Atlanteans? We have every reason to believe, from what we know, that to them, the serpent was the symbol of God. We have also reason to believe that as was later used by the Egyptians and several of the early Phoenician historians and Roman historians were convinced, as we mentioned before, that the Egyptians were the Atlanteans who could not go home because of the destruction of their land after their invasion of Athens or attempt to invade Athens. The royal symbol of the Egyptians was the serpent coiled upon the forehead of the solar crown. And in the crowning of the Egyptian pharaoh, the crown of the north and south, was always adorned by a coiled serpent placed directly in the center of the forehead above the nose. This symbol also comes to us from the great serpent balustrades of Angkor Wat. <coughs> And on the Ankavat symbols, and in many other parts of India, including the serpent of eternal time upon which Vishnu sleeps in the ancient uh, Vishnu Puranic literature, we always have a serpent with seven heads. Now Plato tells us that the Atlantic continent was composed of seven principal islands, over which rules seven princes. We have already learned of the seven heads of Rabban, king of Lanka, the Indian Atlantis. We have also constant reference to this peculiar septenary, the septenary of creating gods at the dawn of things. And we have the seven-headed Naga. We have the mysterious symbol, which many have firm conviction, must have originally represented deity in the ancient Atlantean rites. We also know that this serpent appears wherever we have the motion of the so-called Atlantean or Mongolian culture. We have the mysterious serpents of Gobi. We have the serpent in the symbolism of Tibet and China. We have the serpent gradually metamorphosed into the five-clawed dragon, the imperial symbol of China. A strange and wonderful emblem. 
we know that the dragon lore and the dragon symbol came more and more to be associated with the magician and the sorcerer. We also have the mysterious serpents of Latin America. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, was a good deity, not an evil one. We have the mysterious stone heads. We have the rattlesnake ceremony with the rattlesnake as the messenger between man and the earth in the rites of the Kichis and other tribes of uh, the southwest part of, uh, of the southwest part of our continent. And we have it among the Zunis and the Hopis and even among the Navajo peoples. These symbolisms of the serpent, the serpent with a raised head, we have generally associated with the serpent of evil. But even in the Bible, we are told, be ye wise as serpents, and as gentle as doves, harmless as doves. The combination of the bird and the serpent, the feathered serpent of Gobi, Mongolia, the flying seraphs, the symbols always of the ancient initiate kings, the symbols of the secret masters of magic in ancient times. And it is believed that by this, the Druids, who received it also, and used it twisted as a serpent symbol around the Orphic egg, that among these ancient peoples, this symbol had to do with the magnetic field of the earth. To them, the serpent was the symbol of pure life. To them, it was also the symbol of energy and of power and the control of power and the directing of energy <coughs> seems to have had something to do with the rising wisdom of the old Atlantean savants or priests. There are evidences of the survival of Atlantean peoples, vestiges of peoples who have for one reason or another remained completely separate, have held on to their traditions have regarded themselves as dedicated to a sacred destiny and therefore regarding themselves also with a strange, deep, unchanging pride, a hauter about themselves, the sense of uh, being a chosen people, a people intended for some strange work of preserving without loss an ancient tradition. This, this chosen concept certainly moves the Aryas from northern Asia, for the word Arya means the chosen, or the selected, or the set-apart ones. We do not like to use large terms in large, generous waves, but to the Eastern mind, this great Aya migration, and the classics, and the great writings, is assumed to have moved as early as one million years ago. Now, of course, as we told you the other evening, the very thought of such distant times causes the modern uh, anthropologist to shudder. He doesn't want to think of these things. He wants everything to be recent and up-to-date. But actually, we have much to support the belief that at a remote time, perhaps a million years ago, the progenitors of the Aryans, the Aryas as we know them, moved downward from the trans Himavat across the great uh, Indo-Gangetic plain through the great channels cut by the Indus, the Ganges, and the Jumna. And down these great plains moved a wandering nomadic people. This people was ultimately to conquer the world. This people was to supply the races with which we are most commonly concerned today. From the early part of these migrations came the great Aya Hindu race. From it also came the Persian, the Iranian. From it came the Greek and Latin. Also the Celtic, the Anglo-Saxon, the Teuton, and finally the Polyglot, which we call the American. These peoples all belong to this great Arya migration. This migration moving downward from Central Asia did not move into an uninhabited world. When these peoples met 
the original inhabitants of India, they came upon the Dravidians, a very ancient stock. And here in the, there in the world today, we also have ancient and mysterious stock, such as, for instance, the Basques and other culture groups, which cannot be traced directly either by racial structure or by language to any of the dominant cultures that we know today. These peoples moving down did not immediately expand, probably, very much beyond the boundaries of Asia. They moved down into that great land of India. They moved across, perhaps, to be stopped finally by the mountains that border Afghanistan, and on the opposite side, by the seas that divide China from Japan. The Druids had two colleges in France. These colleges, one of which was the great school of Bibractus, taught so much of learning that it was to the amazement of Caesar. The Romans had nothing comparing to the great universities of the Druids. These universities, however, have vanished from all memory, apparently. They disappeared. But what they taught came from very ancient sources. And we know that such doctrines as rebirth and evolution were known to the Druids. In fact, they borrowed money in one life and gave a receipt promising to pay it back in the next, which indicates a very high a degree of faith, particularly on the part of the individual who accepted the note. <laughs> Today, we trace most of these beliefs to Asia. One of the things that strikes us, as O'Brien points out in his Round Towers of Ireland, is a, is a remain of ancient masonry in the Emerald Isle. These strange towers that look almost like Egyptian obelisks, except that they are circular. These towers belong to a kind of architecture which today is tied into the most elaborate folklore and legendary among a people who have become synonymous with folklore and legendary. The builders of the Round Towers of Ireland, uh, O'Brien Alpines, might have been Buddhist monks. For there is a record that Buddhist monks from Asia reached Ireland at a remote period. Lord Kingsborough, in his great work, The Anacalypsis, also takes it for granted that Asiatic migrants reached Ireland at a very ancient time. How long ago? We do not know. And as we mentioned earlier, the various schools of archaeology are in no common accord as to the primitive remains in Ireland and in the north of Scotland. Another interesting group presents itself to us on the plains of England, where we have the strange mass of stones which we call Stonehenge. This is called a Druid temple, and we've heard it until uh, we have come to believe it. Actually, the Druid remains and records, as preserved uh, in the Welsh records, records and legends, and in the account of Taliesin, and even in the reports of Caesar, the Druids at that time used Stonehenge because they regarded it as a monument created by the gods of previous ages. The stone used in the quarrying of the rocks of Stonehenge has been also a subject of great discussion. Some say that it was precipitated through the air by spirits. Well, that is helpful. Uh, and we are reminded of a root of um, the historian Herodotus, who tells us that the builders of the pyramid started to build at the top and work down. This also gives us a moment uh, of consideration. We also have read recently that it was advanced as a speculation to explain the mysterious figures and heads 
on the Easter Island, as it is now called, were moved by having huge stones quarried out, dropped into a volcano, which fired them out again and dropped them in convenient spots. Uh, this sounds a little too much on the order of modern rocket propulsion. Actually, all of these mysteries are mysterious for one reason only, and that is we cannot conceive a primitive man having the brains to do any of these things in a reasonable way. We are convinced that our primordial ancestors could do nothing better than throw rocks around, and small ones at that. That they were so concerned uh, trying to find fire that they never got any further. Actually, a more interesting group, even, uh, than Stonehenge, is to be found in Brittany, in the western part of France. It is called Karnak, but it is not spelled the same as the Karnak in Egypt. Karnak is a mystic maze of stones, some of which would dwarf those of Stonehenge. But instead of a circle of stones, we have hundreds of them. Great monolithic rocks standing on end, uh, forming rows like soldiers at attention. Why they were put there? Who put them there? No one knows. But one of our more factual friends decided that at a remote time, some native king or prince decided to hide a buried treasure. He hid it under one of the rocks and put all the others there to confuse people who were looking for it. Now, this is good, sober, factual stuff. And pretty ridiculous. These stones that were used in the building of Karnak will weigh up to 15 and 18 tons. They were moved, some of them considerable distances. And like the uh, tremendous carved stones of Guatemala, they apparently were tipped into the ground at one end by digging a pit and allowing the weight of the stone to gradually drop it into the pit. After that, the opposite end was raised and the uh, part in the pit was buried and became the foundation. This happened at Easter Island, we know. It was primitive engineering, but it was successful. But what caused it? What would lead a vast number of persons, that must have been a vast number, to devote an incredible period of time to raise a, a maze of rocks into the air, 12, 15, 18, 20 feet, leave them without a carving or a sculpturing upon them? And if that isn't mysterious enough, we can look around through England, Scotland, and Wales and find all kinds of large rocks that have been balanced like the head of a mushroom on a very small stem-like rock, so perfectly that they have balanced for ages. Why? No one knows. Yet most of these tasks, though primitive, seem to bear witness to a high resolution and purpose. This purpose we get no trace of in the story of the Cro-Magnon Man, we find this pr pro problem or this purpose already exhausted by the time that Egypt began. But there is this similarity. The builders of the pyramids and the great monuments of Egypt used the same basic method, but they had highly refined it so that their achievements uh, were orderly, scientifically reasonable. Somewhere, factors had come in, yet these factors were not unknown to the builders of Stonehenge and Karnak. The Druids found that Stonehenge constituted a magnificent calendar of the equinoxes and solstices. We know that the pyramid is, on, is oriented to the 11th decimal point. It is almost certain that the great ruins of Karnak in Brittany 
had some definite scientific or religious usage. These were built by persons who already knew something. They were not built by the pro magnon but apparently they were standing there long before we come to this dark curtain which divides prehistory from history as we know it now. Irish people claim that the first teachers of their race came not from the East, from Europe, but from the West, and that ancient robed priests came out of the ocean on the west coast of Ireland, and that these were the ones who instructed them. The Irish have a considerable folklore dealing with Atlantis. There is also a great deal of lore relating to this uh, in the Spanish area and in Portugal. And of course what is left of North Africa bears uh, testimony to the same basic accounts. We have comparatively little knowledge of uh, to the levels or to the platforms which can come within investigation by available instruments. Where then can we turn Probably the only way we can turn is this, that in which most have turned, who have sought to penetrate the almost intentional wall of oblivion that has been built up by opinion, attitude, and prejudice between us and the origin of our own culture. We know that the Chaldeans at a comparatively early period uh, sailed along the coasts of Western Europe, reaching as far as Britain and the Scandinavian countries to engage in the merchandising of tin. And we know that wherever a primitive state of Europe, we have some. We can envision the Europe of the Goths and the Vandals. But far deeper than these records are the ancient cultural institutions of the Druids and of the various Bardic orders that were behind uh, the common ways of things. The Druids were a very learned people, as Caesar testifies. Where did they derive their learning? It has been common to assume that they had some connection with Asia. How? Where? When? None of these questions are adequately answered. We cannot pin down the original of these different forms of learning. This is especially true when we, these ancient expeditions came and visited. They left not only the immediate objects of barter, but a cultural impact upon the peoples that they visited. In other words, wherever the Chaldeans bartered, they left something of their philosophy and their culture, further testified to by the experiences of Caesar in interrogating the wise people of Gaul and Brittany. Thus the Migration of a great mercantile project, traveling into very far areas, would certainly imply the establishment of trading centers, trading posts, outposts of one kind or another, and even permanent settlements, turned from history to Stonehenge, 
or to the great Druidic or pre-Druidic monuments in Brittany in France. Here immense mazes, tremendous architectural structures covering huge areas and arranged with considerable mathematical skill must certainly precede the periods in which we believed mathematics to be available to man. We are therefore searching religiously, philosophically, scientifically, ethnologically, anthropologically for the beginning of the human race. Not its physical beginning, merely as creature, but the beginning of its ascent from savagery or a primitive state 